Welcome to the Ocular Surface Academy podcast, TFOS Dues 2 edition. Join us as we meet with the researchers behind this landmark international consensus. Each episode will feature practical clinical takeaways. Before we get to today's episode, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Hello, my name is Jack DeSange, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Medical Therapeutics here at Allegan, an AbV company. You've likely heard that AbV and Allegan have joined forces. We're very proud of the Allegan name and heritage, and will now be known as Allegan and AbV Company. We share a common goal of developing world-class products and solutions for patients, and it's been a seamless transition. AbV and Allegan share a common vision to act with integrity, to serve the community, to drive innovation, but also to embrace diversity and inclusion. Together, we are working to have a significant positive impact on eye care professionals and their patients. R&D will always remain one of our top priorities. Innovation is in our DNA. We're constantly looking for ways to transform ideas into new possibilities. We look for better pathways for disease treatment. Whether it's finding a new solution, a new formulation, or a new delivery method in glaucoma, or retinal diseases, or corneal and ocular surface disease, or refractive conditions. We continuously strive to reinvest in our future and offer an ever-growing portfolio of effective and affordable treatment options for a better tomorrow. I can't emphasize also enough the importance of our relationship with you and our collaboration with eye care professionals. We embrace our partnership with you and our shared goal of improving the quality of life of your patients. If you have any feedback, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and share it with us. But thank you for all that you do for the eye care profession and take care. Welcome your host and co-host for today's episode of the Ocular Service Academy podcast, Dr. Scott Schachter and Dr. Christopher Starr. Well, welcome everybody to what I've been looking forward to for a long time, a discussion on pain and sensation with two of the leading world researchers on neuropathic pain, neurotrophic keratitis, and Dr. Pedram Hamra and Dr. Anakalor, and always joined by Dr. Super, Chris Superstar. <laughs> Appreciate you all being here today, and I'm really excited. I know this is going to, I'm going to want it to go on a lot longer than we're going to be able to do. So thank you both for being here today. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Scott. So what we'll start with, I'd like to hear, first of all, the recognition of the, this neurosensory component of the lacrimal function unit that maybe had been neglected in the past. When TFOS DUS 2 was put together and added this subcommittee, what was the thought behind it? What was the, the goal of the committee? And, and do you think you accomplished it? So I was very excited that I ended up with Pedram on this committee. Uh, Pedram and I have known each other since we were residents. Who knew that we'd be tackling the same problem? And the problem is, I think that nerves are the missing piece of the puzzle in this dry eye umbrella. People were really focused, rightly so, on really understanding the tear foam components. How do we look at them? How do we capture them in a reproducible way? But we are missing this other part, which is how do we understand how nerves contribute to the disease? And in order to do that, first, we need to understand how do nerves contribute to ocular surface health? That was part one of the review that, or the committee that Pedram and I sat uh, sat on in TFOS. And then part two was what goes wrong. And you hit upon it when you say what can go wrong. Well, the nerves can not function, not sense, and we end up with something called neurotrophic keratitis. They can function a little too well. We can end up with neuropathic pain and both can happen in the same patient and you end up with a mixed phenotype. And once you start thinking about the contribution of nerves to health and disease, a lot of the things that we think about and frustrate us about dry eye make more sense. Like why do symptoms and signs not go together? And it's because there's more to symptoms and signs. It's the nerves that connect them. And that really helps explain a lot of the things that we see in our patients and couldn't articulate before. So it was an honor to be part of the committee. It was Pedram and I and lots of really fantastic, smart people. We got to work together and put together this review. So, Pedram, what do you want to add? I think I wanted to add, like, I think the first dues was on inflammation and the, the tear changes by particular hyperosmolarity. But I think in the end, as Anad is saying, what the patient's sensing is through the nervous system. And that piece was elusive, especially to us ophthalmologists, because we don't know enough about the nervous system and how the sensing of things on the ocular surface happen, whether it's through inflammation and the tear film changes. And the goal was really to lay that out and kind of digest it for everybody to kind of be able to follow and how is the anatomy, how do the nerve functions, and how is the sensation occurring and how does it end up in the brain and how is the brain 
perceiving these things and also then as a secondary thing to follow up on that and see how, how does the system malfunction basically in one way through lack of neurotrophic factors ending up in NK or in getting hypersensitized like in inflammation and other diseases and how that disrupts the whole homeostasis of the nervous system as well. Yeah, I think these, these are great points because if I'm not mistaken, I think in the original TFOS dues report, the first one, there wasn't a subcommittee on pain and sensation and, and with an emphasis on the nerves. And it just tells you how much change in those 10 years, why we needed a TFOS dues too. But more, very importantly, as Nanat was saying, it, it really is kind of this sort of missing link, I think, the, the, the role of the nerves and, and sensation and hypersensitive or lack of sensitivity and neurotrophic and neuropathic, how important that is to differentiate these issues when you're addressing a patient with ocular surface disease, whatever it may be, whether it's dry eye or something else, but to really get, get into it and to think about the nerves in all these patients. And so much thanks, in large part, thanks to the two of you, the world literature, you know, in, in ocular surface disease doubled in between dues one and dues two. But certainly, I would say that the, the, the literature around the corneal nerves and the role of the corneal nerves probably more than quadrupled in those 10 years, because it really is an emerging subspecialty of ocular surface disease. And I want to thank you both for the illuminating me and, and our colleagues on this extraordinarily important issue and our patients. <laughs> most importantly, thank you the most. Well, it's, that, really it's what you said about the, the sign. I mean, the two mysteries, the two things I think it struck a chord for me, the sign and symptoms mismatch. We finally started to get an understanding of why that is. And also the prevalence, you know, maybe 35 million Americans have dry eye. Well, how much of that's actually neuropathic pain, neurotrophic care? It's something else, right? It's, it's the nerves. It's not strictly dry eye, right? And those are those patients who wear out your chair, you go through all your traditional therapies and you can't you can't get them to be better. And, and it's your, it's a nervous system problem. It's not a, a dry eye problem. And I think that was, you know, struck me as a practitioner. Chris, it's not just that it made, you know, another committee, it made it to the definition. If you look yes. at the original definition, nerves weren't part of it at all. And in the past 10 years, it became so important that it now it's within the definition, which I think, again, is so helpful. I think inflammation, really important. Understanding osmolarity and other contributors, important but you can't forget nerves. They're just as important. Two things I wanted to add is that one exciting part was beside I'm working with Anat that we work with basic scientists like Carlos Belmonte, who's kind of the father of that field of corneal nerves and to kind of understand the pathophysiology better. And second was to kind of start developing ideas of how, we, how do we actually measure abnormal nerve function in patients as symptoms and signs, because that was something that wasn't really thought about before we have beside corneal sensation. There was a lot of effort went to the subcommittee to actually start understanding of what kind of questionnaires do we use? What kind of tests do we use? What kind of molecular and anatomical thing tests do we use actually to, to measure the abnormal corneal nerve function in these cases? So I think they made good strides in that review together. What what findings or what papers? What any any epiphanies you had along the way for this subcommittee? I have to say, for our subcommittee, it was fantastic. It was a lot of people who just wanted to understand the truth. I was going to say there was no drama. It was really just about truth discovery, and I think everyone was very open minded, reading both clinical and basic science papers. And um, I think we all came in thinking that nerves were important. So you have a biased crowd, but I think that uh, we really harmonized our opinions well, and it came out as something I'm very proud of. Maybe, yeah. Pedro, maybe I missed a controversy, though. Anything that you picked up on? Well, the epiphany was that as we went through the committee, that more and more became clear that nerves are part of the pathophysiology of the disease. And it was interesting how the harmonization committee in the end ended up putting it on the definition at the very end. And at the very was, end, <laughs> but it made it. I think it was the last night. <laughs> the second part was that as we went through it and understood of what the nerves are doing and how they're malfunctioning, we ended up not addressing how we can address that problem. And so the treatment of these conditions fell, wasn't, wasn't added to the committee or was removed at the end. And there was some controversy around that because some people felt they should be there. 
and some people felt not because it's very different than typical dry management. You know, in in retrospect, it's it's almost shocking that we ignored it or overlooked it. The most densely innervated tissue, I believe, in the body in the cornea, and we kind of just didn't think about it right in terms of symptoms. How do you think that came to be? What what caused this recognition? I think I care professionals in general, the reason we went into ophthalmology or optometry is because we like to look at the slit lamp and have the answers, right? We feel like we don't have to talk to the patient. We can diagnose iritis. We can diagnose retinitis. So when it came to dry eye, it seemed obvious. Let's measure tear production and tear breakup time. This is something that we can measure. Nerves are harder. Yes, you can get symptoms, but it's the signs. And Pedram is really the world leader at trying to go and figuring out how do we measure these things that are not as easy to just look at a slit lamp. And so I think that that's something that makes us uncomfortable, although we're getting better at realizing that it's okay. We can use surrogate measures of nerve function, and there are emerging technologies that we can use to add to the signs we already have. And Pedram, since it's your field, I'll let you comment. Well, I think a friend of mine, Don Corp, always has a saying, saying, you don't know what we don't know. So as ophthalmologists looking at the slit lamp, we don't know what we're not seeing, basically. We don't know what we don't see. And so part of this is like the nerves are too small to see on a slit lamp, which is what, 100 years old by now. And if you think about it, there's only a stethoscope that's almost as old as a slit lamp, which uh, we don't rely on anymore. So I think we kind of, based on what we're seeing on the slit lamp, we kind of sometimes miss the, miss advancing the technology like we did with OCT as an example. So I think learning more about the anatomy and as or not is kind of leading the field with measuring function and doing the epidemiology kind of led us to understand the problem better. That's actually quite more common than we think. And it's not as rare as was thought at this point. Yeah, it's funny. The more of these episodes we do and the deeper we get into the subcommittees of the TFOS 2, the more we realize how little we either understand uh, and how much more work is needed and you raise the point that even in the subcommittee, your subcommittee, which it's only, what, three years old? I guess four years old now. Uh, no, three and a half years since the dues 2 was published in 2017. But treatment of neuropathic, you know, that's, we already need TFOS dues 3. Uh, and there's so much that has been published in those short three years. And there's so much more that we need to know as far as treatment. I mean, you know, your, a lot of your work naltrexone and various things, but we'll get to that. Maybe we should sort of go through some of the, some basic stuff that's clinically relevant to people, practitioners watching this. So a patient comes to the office complaining about their eyes, you know, dry, gritty, irritated, painful, discomfort, red eyes. How do you suss out? What is your advice for differentiating between run-of-the-mill dry eye, MGD, evaporative aqueous deficient, versus somebody who might have a neuropathic nerve disorder where they're having pain from their nerves? I think that we need to acknowledge that dry eye symptoms are an umbrella, and they include symptoms of pain, and people can describe pain in many different ways in the eye. It could be dryness, it could be burning, it could be aching, and it could be visual complaints. And when we hear the word pain, we just have to think, okay, nerves are firing, And the question is, is why are they firing? And they can be firing because there's something in the environment that's causing them to fire. So they're firing appropriately. We call that nociceptive pain. And you hit upon it, the things that we look for. We look for anatomical issues. We look for MGD. We look for an unstable tear film. We look for inflammation. But then there's the other side, which means they're firing inappropriately. And that can be the peripheral nerves are firing inappropriately, peripheral neuropathic pain, or the central nerves, the ones that connect the cornea to the brain are firing inappropriately. And any patient can have both, and it's a dynamic system. So you can start with uh, no susceptive pain and over time it can develop to a mixed picture. And so this is just something that we need to think about and acknowledge. So to me, when I hear the word pain, I try to understand what's contributing to pain. First of all, I want to acknowledge that these patients are very complex. And so they're kind of intimidating to most practitioners. And when I started seeing these patients, I used to have a pain clinic at Mass Sinai where I spent like one to two hours for each patient to try to understand that. But 
I realized that that's not feasible. That's worse than neuro off. <laughs> well, you didn't know anything about it, right? It was just learning. <laughs> I guess it kind of is neuro off in, in, in a weird way. It's, it's kind of this gray zone, right? Between neuro and cornea or neurology. But bottom line was that eventually I learned that that's not feasible in a clinical practice. I kind of started looking at how can we make that easier. My practical things are I watch the patient first before I walk in to kind of mm-hmm. observe from the observation, go back to medical school of kind of observing from the patient. I get a thorough history and a review of systems because a lot of uh, these patients have non ocular neurological problems. And I kind of learn about the uh, review of systems as, as it pertains, for example, to the small family neuropathy and looking at like tingling, numbness in the hands, bowel problems. I kind of have this thing that I kind of ask, walk them through and ask them, which take a couple of minutes. And so a lot of time, the resident and the fellows have done that already, or the technicians. We do the um, confocal microscope before I see them even. So I have a, a physical view of the nerve morphology. We do some functional nerve tests, and that's basically measuring the nerve at baseline, giving a hyperosmolar muro drop to see if it gets triggered, confirming it has hypersensitivity, and then adding a preparacane to see does the pain go away partially, fully, or not. And based on that, before I even talk to the patient, I have, a, I have an understanding of what's the physical state, what's their uh, non-ocular findings, and what's the nerve function and nerve morphology looking. And then I kind of get a history from the patient's point of view quickly to kind of understand what's their complaint, really, what's their story. And many times after you've seen quite a few of these, things start to kind of fall into different categories, whether it's hypersensitivity, like an outset, or like a burning and whether it's like a post-surgical case with post-cataract or post-LASIK, which they have always the same pattern. Based on that, I then start developing a um, algorithm of whether I treat them with a, like a topical drops, like serum tears, steroids, whether I just go straight to oral pharmacotherapy, or how urgent the pain relief is, whether the patient is kind of in, in severe discomfort, so we want to need how fast we need to get to the same goal and what the patient's goal is as well. And then we also do extensive serology to look for underlying problems. And many of these patients have autoimmune disorders and neuropathies, and these then get addressed further as well to get to the bottom of what's actually the cause of that these patients had that led them to what they basically developed. And basically acknowledging to the patient that their symptoms are real, because many times, as you all know, we don't see much on the exam, especially with neuropathic pain, and the patients are being told it's not real, it's crazy. And, and so the acknowledgement itself is a big relief for many of these patients. And, and, and the more important thing is to give them hope in the end that this is going to be getting better and it's not going to be like it is. So pain without stain, of course, right? And can you describe, I mean, most practitioners don't have access to a confocal, but can you describe the preparacane test? Does your staff do that or is that something that you do? And how do, you, how do they do it or you do it exactly? So it's both. Either the staff does it or I do it. It's basically I put a I ask the patient's pain in both eyes, left and right, or discomfort. I ask because it's not always pain. It's it's burning, light sensitivity. What is the discomfort level? They give a number of zero to ten, visual analog scale. I put a papyrican drop in. I wait ninety seconds, and then I ask again, and then they give us another number. And based on that, we determine the fact. The 90 seconds came about, we did serial studies from 10, 20, 30 to five minutes to see what's the best cutoff where basically it starts plateauing. And that's something that we kind of had looked into of what's the best time point. I thought initially it was 30 seconds, but it ended up that the pain does decrease in these patients over time. And so 90 seconds you think is optimal? That's what we found in the studies, 90 to 120 seconds, yeah. I love the fact that uh, it takes most of us about five visits and a lot of failed medications to figure out that somebody has a, a problem with their nerves. And Pedro says he observes the patient as he's walking into the room and can figure it all out as he's just gl- glancing at the patient on That's the way. That's what in. I said. I said, I think I'm a little discomfort. <laughs> To that point, history is critically important, right? There are key words to look for, perhaps, in chief complaint and history, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that or not? Right. So, Pedram, I admire you because I can't do an hour or two. So my goal is to figure out (laughs) how to get the information in the not least time, but in a reasonable amount of time. And so for me, I find that standardized questionnaires in the waiting area really help. And part of it is history. We're really good at, at asking about autoimmune diseases. But I find with pain, 
pain travels together. And I want to understand, do they have a diagnosis of migraine, fibromyalgia? These are some triggers that make me think that maybe some of the eye pain has a neuropathic component. The other things I want to understand are the onset of pain. And I do exactly what Pedram does, where I try to bin my patients into categories that I think will predict what they have and what they'll respond to. And so I have the pain that started right after surgery. Most often it's refractive surgery, but not always. I have post-cataract, post-glaucoma, post scleral buckle. Retina people, of course, never want to hear that their surgeries cause pain. They're the hardest to convince, but I see pain after all surgeries. And then there's the bilateral pain that started spontaneously. Maybe they have a family history of migraine, associated headache. That's my migraine-like pain. And then there's the atypical you know, unilateral pain that makes me think that maybe there's actually a lesion I need to go for. We could talk about that later. So it really does help me trying to understand the risk factors and then the pain phenotypes. And I get that all through standardized questionnaires. Which questionnaires do you use routinely? Is it tri-eye questionnaires? Are there... So that's just a past medical history questionnaire. But then I also have standard questionnaires that I use in the clinic. I use the DQ5 and the OSD. The reason I do that is the DQ5 lets me know about discomfort and dryness, whereas the OSD has more specific questions about triggers and effect on quality of life. And then I use pain specific questionnaires. I use the just an NRS, a numerical rating scale, and then the modified NPSI, where I look for things like burning, sensitivity to light and wind. Uh, Pedram has an excellent questionnaire. It's a little longer that he developed the o- OCAS or OPAS. OCAS, yeah. OPAS, OPAS. And he can, he can talk about that. But I, I find that that is really, really helpful. And then the thing that I think is different in the flow is that I don't think you can get through a any dry eye exam, not just a neuropathic exam, if you don't see the patient before the eye drops go in. Once they've had preparacaine, you lose your ability to do some of the diagnostic tests. So the key is whenever any of my techs hear the word dry eye, they just know no drops. And that has been the biggest change in my clinical flow, but it's not that hard. <laughs> so then once you kind of get used to that difference, I think Pedram and I are both lucky in that we have research fellows that get really good at the quote dry eye exam and all the dry eye patients go there and have the tests that are needed before the drops go in. And part of that testing is the prepare can challenge that my research fellows generally do. And so it still takes longer than a, you know, non dry eye patient, but it's, I've gotten it down to less than two hours. So that's good. Well, I've never heard it called the OSD before, so <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> Another thing I learned, OSD, I referred to as OSD. I thought, what's the OSD? So you get a patient, you put in there, they got a pain of eight in one eye. You put in preparacaine, pain goes to two. How do you talk to that patient versus a patient in the next room that pain goes from eight to seven or doesn't budge? Pain stays the same versus significant reduction versus somewhere in the middle. Can you each... Well, maybe take turns telling me how you how you talk to those patients about treatment, prognosis, et cetera. So as Anat said, we've developed, I mean, the two the two hours was 10 years ago. Now it's down to 15 <laughs> minutes or so. But part of it is the questionnaires where you get a feel of what's bothering the patients. But in terms of your question, I think in a patient that has majority pain relieving, but that's complete or most of it, I talked to the patient that, okay, we need to kind of reset the nerve function in the, in the eyes and the, the serum tears to various neurotrophic factors will contribute to that and that you have to prevent the resensitization, meaning that, that the abnormal function being reinitiated. And a lot of time that's done through inflammation. So we need to suppress the inflammation at the same time. So a combination of, for example, serum tears and low dose steroids, we can achieve that as a first step, as long as the patient's pain is not like a 10 out of 10 at that point. If that's the case, then I do additional steps. I may put a Procara in, which kind of initiates the pain relief more rapidly, or even start oral medication just temporarily to get the pain down to a certain level, similar to how we treat like a shingles or zoster patient. But majority, the patients are okay with just doing topical drops. The patient where the pain goes from eight down to a seven or doesn't budge, I explained to them that the pain is likely non-ocular, which means that's either a ganglionopathy, meaning the disease is in the trigeminal ganglion or in the brain. And I give them the analogy of phantom pain of how a soldier loses a limb, the limb still hurts, although it's it's gone. And it's similar to the to the eye where the cornea nerves have been damaged and the brain develops a phantom cornea in that case. 
and that the that eye drops typically don't help with that and that requires systemic pharmacotherapy and that give them the different options of what they are, what the chances are and what the side effects are. And together with the patient, we pick then the one where usually myself, I know Anad has a different preference. Go, I do go to neurotriptyline or low dose naltrexone where we have efficacy of 50% or more in these cases. How about you, Anad? Do you have a similar conversation? And, and on top, I'll add to that. Who are we missing? Who are practitioners missing, misdiagnosing? What should practitioners really be tuned into in general looking for neuropathic pain? There's no gold standard diagnosis. And so clinicians just need to listen for clues. So some of the clues start with history. I have pain that started after a surgery. I have bilateral pain that's associated with evoked pain to wind or light. So those are some of the clinical clues that you're probably dealing with nerve dysfunction in addition to or in isolation to other issues like anatomical issues or like cure parameter issues. So then the next thing is on the exam. If you see a disconnect, pain out of proportion to clinical findings, make sure you're not missing the clinical findings. Sometimes it can be subtle. So, you know, using stains are really important because sometimes you'll miss things like contact lens overwear if you don't use lysamine green to stain the conjunctiva. So you do need to do a thorough exam to make sure you're not missing no susceptive causes of pain. But if you do and the pain is disproportionate, you need to start thinking that there could be a neuropathic source. Any abnormality on corneal sensitivity, I think it's really easy to do. I like dental floss because the diameter is the same, but if you don't like having dental floss in your pocket, you can use a cotton tip and just get a sense of, is it decreased, increased, absent? Any abnormality in corneal sensitivity suggests that there's an abnormal function that may be contributing to the picture. And then again, the response for paracaine. And so I find that Not everyone has access to a Belmonte anesthesiometer. Not everyone has access to confocal microscopy, but everyone has access to the basic things that they need to get a sense of whether dysfunctional nerves are part of the picture. So everyone can do it. No excuses. Thanks for joining us for the first part of our discussion on the neurosensory aspect of the lacrimal functioning unit. Be sure to tune in next time for the rest of this interesting conversation. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Join us for our next episode soon. Find us online at www.ocularsurfaceacademy.com, all major podcast platforms, and YouTube. For over 18 years, iEco has been an industry leader of natural, effective, at-home dry eye management. From our line of tea tree eyelid cleansers and patented controlled moist heat compresses to our nighttime hydrating masks and daytime moisture chambers, we support you and your patients with scientifically proven products for mild, moderate, and severe dry eye. Join us today to experience the iEco difference at iEco.com. That's E-Y-E-E-C-O.com.